Hey folks, welcome back to the Dark Horse Podcast live stream 77 named after the Talking Heads album. Yes. Am I correct? There was a Talking Heads album 77. I believe I think so. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. think so. In fact, one of the, wow, my computer just went black. Um, hmm, there it is. Um, one of the comments, which I, where is it? Where is it? I can't find anything in here. Um, ah, sorry if someone pointed this out already. One of the super chat question comments. Sorry if someone pointed this out already. I'm late to the show. Technically, this is your 16th palindromic episode. And I'm going to object to this high, friend, um, on the basis that the way that this is the 16th is if you count one through nine as palindromes. Mm. Oh, uh, right. That's like one being a prime, which it isn't. This is exactly this is exactly where my brain went. I don't think one and three and six count as palindromes because they're just singular. And in order to be the same backwards and forwards, there needs to be something interesting about that fact. So, you know, A, the word... Palindrome? I guess, but how uninteresting. So, yes, technically right, but I'm going to stick with my seventh, seventh palindromic episode. Yeah, um, I think that's yeah, that's better. Um, but I, I no, I appreciate. I don't, I don't feel like that's a that's a pedantic comment. I appreciate it. I just, uh, I just reject it. Um, boy, I wish we could swivel the camera. We've got two really adorable cats in the window. Um, we need a mirror. We could hold the mirror over here. Nah, we're good. Yeah, they're yeah, they're, they're cute though. Yeah, they're nice, they're nice they're cats. Very, they're... Yeah, high quality cats we have. Okay. First question. Uh, we have three questions from um, last week's episode, then a question from the Discord, and then we'll embark on the questions from this week. The first one. So, have you been still using the electric unicycle? And what kind of electric unicycle are you using? Whoa. I know. Electric unicycles are taking off. I've seen two in the last week in Portland. It was months before I saw anyone else. And they on were Monday. different ones because you could tell that the models were different. Yes. People, they, I think they, I, I was with you when you saw one of them and the guy was wearing a full face helmet. So you can't necessarily be sure it's not the same guy, but different, different unicycles. Yeah. Totally men different. in both cases. Yeah. It's pretty much always men. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, that'll change, but someone uh, else is holding their beer off camera. Uh, you know, the thing is, uh, there is a way in which men are a certain degree expendable, and electric unicycle isn't, let's say, all that safe. It's safer than one wheel, but um, he says to the mother of the two boys whom he has introduced to electric unicycles, um, "It's true, expendable." It's tr you say. Um, yes, and a man. I mean, you know, the the boys, the electric unicycle under the family rules about what they are not allowed to damage, including their their brains, their backs, their eyes, sensory organs. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. So uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's not to say they could. And they are uh, nothing if not rule followers. Our children. Oh goodness. Yes. Well, no, they aren't uh, <laughs> especially rule follower. They follow. They follow, they follow good rules. Good rules. And yeah. This is, I mean, this is something we wrote into our book. We taught them, as we hope that all parents teach their children, to honor good role, good rules and assess whether or not the rules that they are being asked to follow are, in fact, good ones. Mm -hmm. And there is room for disagreement as to whether or not uh, some rules are good or not, and that is where the nuance is. Yes. All right. I'm struggling with the, uh, the underlying question here. The question was, have I been electric unicycling? And I really haven't that much. I did get on the electric unicycle... Uh, a week ago or so, I found that the, I forgot to think about the fact that the tire would be uh, at relatively low pressure. It was too mushy. Um, you didn't pump it up before you? No, you pumping going. them up is a bit of a pain. Okay. Um, and I, it didn't occur to me until I was already out. I will say on electric unicycle, unlike every other mode of conveyance that has inflatable tires that I know of, the tire pressure spectacularly changes how it is to ride the thing. Um, if you pump it up uh, with a lot of pressure, they become very squirrely. Um, so it's something one wants to do uh, thoughtfully. It's the whole, there's only one point of connection to the ground thing. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Um, so, yeah, I, I have an in-motion V10. Um, it is marvelous in many regards. Should uh, we show, I mean, some number of people aren't going to know what the hell this is. Aren't going to know what the hell we're okay, talking so about. So you keep going. I'm gonna, yeah, Zach. You, you, you will know better than I what to pull up. 
No. Um, just bring up a picture here. To, uh, He's going to do it. You talk. Um, you bring up a... Uh, you want a, me to bring up a picture? Yeah. yeah. Oh, Zach's going to do it. All right. So um, I have... So, you know, the, the key things are what, what company did you buy from, which has um, a lot of implication for how safe these devices are. Um, so in motion, I would say is the, the go-to for people who put safety at a high priority, um, in motion seems, uh, committed to the idea of not pushing each machine to the absolute limit of what it's capable of. And, uh, thereby what you don't want is something called a cutout where the power suddenly, uh, drops to zero because the motor can't keep up with the demand. That's a very dangerous phenomenon. So pitching forward on your face is not the fun part of electric unicycling. No, it is not. So okay. you want a company that wants to be around and therefore not be sued. And in motion seems to be that company for the moment. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Gotway is the, if you want to milk the absolute maximum performance out of one of these things, that's the go-to, but, uh, it's, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm too old for that. Um, but anyway, I would say, uh, if I was going to, if I was thinking about getting one, the problem is the money, they're not cheap. Um, but if I was thinking about getting one, I might get, uh, the, newer in motion with suspension on bicycles i'm not a fan of suspension at all but on electric unicycle where you have one point of contact and a speed bump can send you flying um, the idea of some shock absorption is a pretty good one and that's a very capable unicycle that people seem to really like so hey zach is the video that you made at the end of middle school um still available of you and your brother on electric unicycles Actually, that's not a bad idea. Yeah. When, so when you were finishing eighth grade and Toby was in sixth, um, filmed almost entirely when we were still in Olympia. Yep. Right? Um, so anyway, maybe we should link to that or, um, yeah. Yeah. Maybe even show it another time, but yeah. I don't think we have time right now. All right. Um, it's terrific. And it, show, it shows off also um, some of your then nascent video production skills. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, this, and it was a music video, effectively. What was the song you used? It was a Weezer song. Yeah. Something and, about summer. Yeah. And you got... Um, you, you, the lead singer of uh, Weezer was uh, tickled by Zach's use of, of their song, gave us permission yep. to put it on YouTube with the song, and uh, said he was a fan. And next time they had a concert in Portland, we should, uh, uh, we should come see it. And um, then COVID been... There hasn't been a concert, but anyway, that's where it is. <laughs> okay. Well, you've become much more expert at production, video production since then. Um, next question. Yes. Is there any data on how the bats are handling the corona? Yes, I don't sir. think so. I haven't seen any. No, but I mean, it's, it's also... The bats have their coronaviruses, and we don't give it a second thought. So there's nothing new, as far as we know, going on with bats and coronavirus. Um, they're just having their usual interaction with it, which is presumably ancient, and there are many different strains. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, you know, it's only our awareness of the bats' interaction with uh, coronavirus is only, you know, we didn't know very much until... Uh, the first SARS-CoV and now SARS-CoV-2. Um, but anyway, yes, I would imagine the bats are doing exactly what they always do with it, which is live with it. Um, you know, I mean, yeah. what choice they're, do they have? They're pretty stoic, bats, as a group. As far as we know, yeah. I mean, they, they, they do Although a certain a amount of, that, of complaining, but it's a yeah. lot of it's ultrasonic. Yeah. 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 True. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Next question. Your talk with Brittany King reminded me of a saying I often use. We are all reluctant soldiers in a war that none of us started, but which we all want to end. On that same note, have you ever seen Kingdom of Heaven? I feel the line, quote, we fight over an offense we did not give against those who were not alive to be offended, is highly relevant to both the current culture war and the U.S. relations with Russia, North Korea, etc. Much love. Hashtag heal the divide. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it fits. I haven't seen Kingdom of Heaven, just an answer to that I have question. not seen it either. Um, but I would say uh, in some ways, 
yes, this points to an irony of being drafted into uh, a battle that is so old that nobody around was there for its beginning. And on the other hand, uh, the nature of evolution uh, is one of lineage competition. And so in some sense, we are always drafted into battles that nobody around was here for the beginning of because we are, you know, the current cohort in um, an evolutionary conflict between things that are almost impossibly ancient. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so we should look into it. Yeah. Good. Okay, this from the Discord this week. The same people who are very vocal on trans rights also tend to be very dismissive of, parentheses, non-opportunistic, self-identification as black by some white people. Considering that unlike gender, race has very little basis in biology, shouldn't they be more open to such self-identification, if anything? What's the catch? And the, the question doesn't um, allude to it, but of course Dawkins... Um, Dawkins lost an award given to him 20 years ago, I think, by the, what is it, the American Humanistic Association or something, um, because he basically tweeted a, this, this observation. Yeah. Um, uh, he just put these two observations side by side that um, we're not allowed to, um, to engage the question of transracialism, but we're obliged to accept uh, transgenderism, discuss. And this uh, rears its ugly head with some regularity. I'm trying to remember back in 2017, there was an academic who published a paper on this issue and found herself canceled over it. I'm trying to remember who that was. But uh, in any case, first of all, I do want to correct one thing. The idea, <laughs> yeah, you do know exactly <laughs> what I'm going to say. The idea that race has very little basis in biology is both true and false. Um, the implication of it is false. Um, what we call race is the bastardization of a, that's what I thought it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Rebecca Tuvel in Hypatia wrote in defense of transracialism back in 2017. Sorry. Um, so what we call race is a bastardization of a real thing, which might be called population or lineage, depending upon how, uh, what scale you want to look at it. And it is a bastardization that is itself born of racism. In other words, the idea of race is a weaponized version of an objective concept. That said, the objective concept captures, if, if we talk about whether or not you can correctly detect somebody's ancestry when you encounter them, you know, on the street. In general, we're pretty good. And the problem is you can't tell what fraction of somebody is from Africa or from Asia or Europe. Um, but you can in general tell that, you know, if somebody is predominantly from Asia, it's not hard to recognize that. And that's not your mind tricking you. That's actual um, uh, phenotype derived from genes that come from a different population. Some of that's going to be adaptive. Skin color is an adaptation to uh, UV radiation, and um, the darkness of skin is an adaptation to how directly the UV radiation comes through the atmosphere. If it comes through at a big slant, you don't need very much melanin to protect you. If it comes in very directly because your ancestors are from the equator, then you need more melanin to insulate your genes from mutation. But in any case, the um, the real reason that we do apparently take seriously the idea of switching sexes, which is not something that one can actually just simply elect to do, it's not possible, whereas we somehow bar the very same uh, concept when it comes to uh, to race, even though at some level that's much more plausible because lots of people exist between races by virtue of hybridization and therefore how you identify we all agree is to some degree up to you, right? And the problem is at the extremes we don't agree with that, which is inconsistent. Um, but in essence, it goes back to what we were talking about in the first hour uh, podcast, which is that effectively the rule, the unwritten rule of this game is we will accept those things that put people we decide should have an advantage uh, at advantage, and we will reject the very same logic when it would give an advantage to people that we don't want to give an advantage. So this is basically all about logical cheating, and that's the reason for the inconsistency. 
there's so much to say here. Um, just a few things to add. We have two words over in sex territory. We have sex and gender. And there are a lot of people um, who are saying gender isn't real. It's a totally made up thing. No. As we've said over and over and over again, gender is real. Gender is, and we have slightly different um, versions of this, understandings of what it is. It's called sex role when it's not humans. It's the behavioral manifestation of sex. Um, you know, sex and sex is binary. And in all species with genetic sex determination, uh, which is to say, uh, if you have sex chromosomes as mammals do and as birds do and as some other clades do as well, um, immutable. You cannot change sex. Um, there are species that can change sex, clownfish famously. Um, uh, it doesn't. It has not happened. There appears to be a mechanistic block on it actually happening in species with genetic sex determination. Um, so in species um, that are, are sexual, as we are, in 500 million years of uninterrupted sexuality in our lineage alone, um, we use the term gender to describe basically the software part of, of sex. And that's more the language that you tend to use. The sex is the hardware and, and, and gender, gender is, is the, the software. software of sex. Yep. Yeah. And, um, and gender will be a lot more fluid. You know, gender, you know, sex is binary. Gender is you know, likely to be strongly bimodal, but it won't be, it won't be binary. And given the complexity, given how many things go into describing how it is that you're manifesting in the world, it shouldn't be shocking to us to um, recognize that sometimes people's internally understood sense of what their sex is, is a mismatch for what sex they actually are. And so we call them trans transgender, right? Um, interestingly, you know, race does not have two sets of words, right? Like, you know, so race is a deeply imperfect proxy for a real biological phenomenon, which we call, as you say, population or lineage. Um, but maybe precisely because there are real fundamental differences on average <laughs> between the sexes. And while they're presumably are some differences between races. They are much more vague and inchoate and much more mixed because we have a human history of all sorts of intermixing, yep. right? Like we all come from an equal number of male and female ancestors, um, but each one of us, with the exception of the very, very rare people who are intersex, um, are one or the other. Um, and we all come from, you know, a mother and a father. Um, whereas race is a messier proposition, right? So, um, you know, you could, you, you could say, you know what, I'm going to honor, you know, someone, someone who is, who is, who is biracial, um, could say, I'm going to honor my, you know, German lineage as opposed to my Afro-Caribbean lineage in this thing that I'm doing. And I'm going to identify more over here that, you know, like that, that's a, that's a choice. It's a legitimate choice that people can make. Um, but what we don't tend to allow is, um, I know of no thing in my particular history that is Asian, but I'm going to call myself Asian. And I think, you know, why, why would we, on the other hand, um, it does, it, it becomes confusing then at the point that we say, but you can do that when it comes to sex. And maybe it's more obviously a problem for those of us who are thinking deeply about this precisely because lineage is real. Do you know for sure you don't have any Asian in your past? How can any of us know, right? You know, or Native American or African, you know, we, we all have African in our past, but it depends on how far back you're going, right? So, um, so they re race and sex are just fundamentally different. And they're not fundamentally different because race is entirely a social construct and sex isn't, which is the place that you started. Yep. They're fundamentally different um, because we all have male and female ancestors and we all are one with a tiny number of exceptions for people who are intersex. Uh, whereas race is this inter interpolating, um, you know, often uh, retrogressing set of lineages, um, the differences between which um, grow more and more, um, less and less distinct the longer we move into a globalist society. Absolutely. Um, interestingly, I think, you know, the one drop rule is an attempt to take race and make it binary, which it is inherently not because you can have right. effectively, uh, you know, any ratio. Mm -hmm. Uh, of races and our uh, sense of um, 
So you have a continuous variable that is race, and we have a racist past of attempting to make it binary, and uh, we have the opposite thing taking place in sex space, where we have something that is inherently binary, and you have this force attempting to make it continuous, and the point is, okay, those are actually mirror images yeah. of each other. You've revealed that you're not working with logic, Yeah. Um, that this is entirely ideology-based. Yeah, you're cheating, yeah. <laughs> uh, logically yeah. speaking. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Begin with the questions from this last hour. Um, and the, the first two are just comments. Um, Heather, I support what you said at the beginning of the show regarding not understanding. I know what you mean, and I'm so sorry. Prayers for you all. If you are an atheist, you can currency convert those prayers to thoughts without any worry of offense or discomfort. Thank you. Um, been watching since you guys started. This is an overdue thank you for your intelligence and sanity during insane times. You are consistently therapeutic. Thank you as well. Next question. People fight a lot over ideas, especially what is reality. Battles over ideas could just be metaphor. But maybe mental weapons and defenses evolve just like tooth and claw. It's a jungle out there and in here. Your thoughts? Thanks. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, I think there's... A reality and there is an overextension of it. So the reality is that the different belief systems are proxies for lineages. And so lineages with differing views of the way the cosmology of the universe works are in battle and often they will fight as if what they are fighting over is the analysis of how the universe works. But in fact, what you've got is lineages battling each other. And, it, you know, you wouldn't be confused if they were, um, you know, battling troops of monkeys. You would know that it wasn't about belief system. Um, but we do get confused because humans espouse belief system in the context of these, uh, these kinds of battles. Um, but the other thing is that when we argue very typically, so if we argue between populations over, you know, which God is for real or whatever, that's one kind of disagreement. It's a whole different kind of disagreement when individuals who are part of the same uh, lineage fight over what's true, right? Whether they're talking at the level of metaphor or whether they're talking at the level of fact, there is a battle in which everybody has an interest in the superior idea winning, mm. right? And the superior idea can mean the most effective idea rather than the most true idea. But the point is, you, there's a question of whether or not you're on the same team, and this is a battle over, you know, which foot to put forward, or whether you're on different teams competing for space. And you don't want to confuse those two things because they really are fundamentally different. And you know, th there are mixtures, right? You can be battling for a position in an organization and deploying arguments therefore as an antagonist, but in theory you and the other person that you're battling with both have an interest in the organization prospering because you're both tethered to it. Um, but allowing for all of those nuances, you do have, is this a collaborative battle? dialectic. Some people will remember me invoking dialectic oddly as I was confronted by um, uh, mistaken, confused students in the hallway at Evergreen. Um, dialectic is about battling over ideas where the uh, objective is to figure out what's true rather than to win. And then there's debate, which is the version where you want to win irrespective of what's true. And uh, those two things look alike, but they're very different. Yeah. Very good. I got the first Pfizer shot, saw the GVB podcast. Have I already fucked my innate response? And if I don't do shot two, my adaptive two? I'm 30, healthy, only did it for employability and travel. Seems good to say, no thanks, government, if the uh, vaccinations per variant starts. Yes? Love you all. Yeah, this, this is a tough one. And yeah, the, the fact is we are increasingly often asked... People will give us the details of their life. They will want advice on whether or not to be vaccinated, what vaccine they might prefer, all of these things. And the problem is this is just impossible, yeah. right? We can, you know, give you a guess based on what we understand. But what we know for sure is that we don't understand enough. In fact, everything that we have said about 
the potential hazard of these vaccines is predicated on the fact that we simply couldn't possibly know anything about their long-term implications. Exactly. exactly. So I, I mean, <clears throat> apropos of that, with no, with no direct response to this, because we can't know, I was reading an article, I don't remember where it was published, a, a, a peer-reviewed article on um, risks um, to pregnant women and their babies from COVID. And um, in response, the sort of the, the media coverage of that article was, therefore, um, states and other jurisdictions should be um, putting pregnant women on the priority list to get vaccinated. And, you know, that, that's all it said. You know, it, 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 it stopped doing the analysis at the point it started promoting vaccines. Yeah. And... Um, I think the risks to mother and baby from COVID are potentially very high, for sure. Um, we and we, we've the, the the data have begun to come in. I think that the risks to mother and baby uh, for these vaccines are likely to also exist and perhaps be very high, and we have less access to those data in part, I think, because they are being politically uh, tamped down, not because they don't exist. There's, I mean, it's also going to be a much smaller number of of people, you know, pregnant women who have gotten who have gotten vaccinated. But um, you know, we we got asked we got asked a question like this a number of weeks ago about. Um, you know, a couple, she's pregnant and um, they were due to get their shots and, and, and should they? And um, I think, you know, maybe for the last time, because I think we really, we really can't be giving individual advice like this. But, you know, I said, if, if it were me, if it were me and we were in a position where we felt like we're ready to go ahead with the shots and I was pregnant, I would, I would encourage you to continue to do what you were already going to do. If you were already going to do it, get the shot. And I would not until, um, until after the baby was born. And I would just double down on all of my efforts to absolutely hundred percent not get COVID. Um, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a terrible disease and we, and it's unknown what all the effects will be on, um, on gestation and, you know, apparently preterm births, um, are the thing that we see an uptick in, um, both both for um, pregnant women who've gotten COVID and pregnant women who've gotten the vaccine. So you know, and, and maybe that's not a sur surprise because the vaccine is going to, in some ways, mimic what the um, what the disease is. Yeah, it, it it in some way mimics it, and in some ways it doesn't. And yeah. it's a it, it's a situation in which um, one wants more information and. Uh, one also wonders what information that we do not get. Yeah. Um, but I would point out that the danger of a world in which the powerful believe that they are entitled to decide what the facts are and that they are obviously rationalizing, that they um, take facts that point in a direction they like and elevate them, and they take facts that are inconvenient and downplay them, runs every risk that when, you know, if they've doubled down on these vaccines are safe, everybody should get them, we're going to force you to get them, all of those things. And then it turns out actually there were hazards they didn't anticipate. How likely is it that we will get an honest accounting of that? Because effectively they have put their reputations on the line being way too certain and too clear about that safety. And they will, they will I, I can tell you what they will say to themselves is that our ability to get people to listen to our advice in the future depends on them not finding out that we were wrong in this case. And we can all infer on the outside that that will be their approach because that sounds like people covering their asses. Mm -hmm. And so then the problem is we have to account for the fact that we don't know what fraction of what we should know we are actually hearing, right? So anyway, the whole thing uh, requires us, again, to... Um, to go back to what we talked about in the uh, earlier part of the podcast, effectively, we are going to be forced to rediscover the value of a university system where people are free to say really inconvenient things and to establish that they are true in spite of the fact that powerful people don't want them to be, right? Yep. That's a very expensive lesson to learn. Yep. Next question. Hi, Brett and Heather. 
I am trying to get a master's degree in some field of psychology, and I can't tell how far gone the schools I'm looking at have gone into wokeness. Do you have any recommendations for judging a school's woke level on a scale of 1 to 10? Well, if you've been watching us, you know that Brett prefers a scale of 3 to 17, so let's start there. <laughs> right. Well, you should try that scale on your school of choice. You should just call them up and see what they think about such a scale, and that might tell you something. They won't like it. They're not going to like it? No. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to take that personally. Go for it. Yeah, but it's very, you know, I, I don't know. Somebody probably ought to be cataloging um, output from these various organizations. One thing you can do to the extent that you might not be in a position to fight back, you might be in a position to anonymously forward communications from uh, whatever department you Well, no, but this person is trying to figure out where to go. Right, but my point is that well, maybe what we need, and it doesn't help this person, but maybe mm -hmm. what we need is a repository where you can say, well, all right, uh, you, how many, you know, what have we seen from the University of Wyoming's mathematics department? And mm -hmm. then you can get a sense for whether the, you know, it's leading the charge in the direction of wokeness or if mm -hmm. it's reluctant about it or yeah. it yep. hasn't said anything at all, um, that that would be a useful kind of information to have. And as far as I know, we don't have any access to it. Yeah. Yeah. The, the unfortunate answer is we don't, um, You know we what you might... No, go ahead. Go, go on. Well, I was just wondering what would happen if you called up uh, and said, I'm interested in joining your program. I'd like to know um, what what your approach is to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and then just let them tell you. Well, I mean, but the problem with that is, A, um, you call up as yourself, and you're basically in the system now as someone who's asking. Oh, I wouldn't do that. And... Um, Right. So you have to be anonymous or have someone else call on your behalf. But I think actually the bigger question, the bigger concern is that um, as we have seen over and over and over again, as you as you mentioned, actually, in the first hour today, um, you engage with people just on the street in retail cir circumstances, whatever. And at this moment in time, pretty much everyone is just giving you the standard, uh, the standard flat responses. No one is having real human interactions. Um, but you, you know, you slip the veil a little bit, you know, you indicate that actually you don't think like everyone else does. And people are pretty quickly willing to, to let that slide. But not if you're talking to the program secretary, or the dean or the chair of the department, like they, they're not allowed to do that. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't, I don't think you can possibly get the truth that way. Um, I don't know how you do get the truth. I mean, yep. I think you want to, um, you know, I, I, I think basically everyone is going to have the same garbagey, like DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion stuff up on their web pages and all. Um, but to some degree, the advice that we used to get and give um, as graduate students and then um, encouraging sometimes students to go to graduate school themselves was right. But this is a, this is more specific, which is that talk, talk to graduate students in the program already. The problem here is that you yeah. need to figure out who among the people who are already there um, is not so scared or so woke um, that they won't be able to say something to you um, that's real. Um, but really, you know, talking, you know, going to say a lab meeting of a professor you want to work with and then talking to one or two of her, his graduate students to find out if they're actually good to work with, still not um, the bulletproof in terms of an approach, but it's, it gives you much more of a sense than just, than just getting the uh, dog and pony show that the department will put on for you. So unfortunately, uh, I think what we are discovering and trying to talk ourselves into the idea that there's some solution is that what we have is an especially pernicious problem that a culture of fear means that the information that you are entitled to have about how uh, this question is viewed inside a department where you're planning to go spend an important part of your life and um, submit to their judgment of you in some sense. That information is going to be impossible to come by because those who know may well be too scared to say, and understandably so. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I don't mm -hmm. think there is a good solution. One one thing maybe um, is I don't know for sure for master's um, degrees, but I think all of the um, post-baccalaureate degrees have theses of some sort. Um, and so looking and, and most departments also will have a site that lists that just has links to all the recent theses or dissertations. Um, look into those. 
and just like reading the abstract and and um, some some departments will skew heavily woke in terms of the theses. And again, not perfect, but that might actually it's noisy. Yeah. And what you really want to know, you can't know, which is um, which people uh, threw their hands up and left or were driven out because they would have delivered. Right. But that, I mean, that goes in the right direction that like that, that skews in the correct direction because you'll have a, a higher concentration of, of woke and woke adjacent theses and you know to steer clear. Yeah. But it, the problem is in the right direction in terms of figuring out what the data mean. I agree. It goes in the right direction, but it's very hard to interpret across a small number of theses, how many, uh, or how, what the degree of pressure is, how open to something else the department would be. It can also, I think it also potentially can help you decide between um, advisors uh, because, I mean, really this, this stuff is so much in the hands of individuals and even at the wokest schools, there are people who are, you know, there are faculty, there are professors who are trying to do right and who are continuing to mentor students in the way that they want to mentor them. It's harder and harder for them, but. Um, yeah. And uh, the alternative is. Uh, oh, good. It's not. No. I don't know. I mean, fortunately, I'm what? not. Well, it's uh, cryogenic suspension, trying mm -hmm. to wait this out. Mm -hmm. um, but the problem is, this I person's just, applying to grad school. Um, they don't. They don't have the money for cryogenic suspension. Oh, you're right. Yeah, you're right. Um, I mean, I'm guessing. Well, I mean, do you have a freezer? I do, but I, he can't put his head in our freezer. <laughs> <laughs> You're cutting off his head now? He's cutting off his own head, I think. He's going to go to grad school on the far end of this. I was thinking maybe he'd go with whole body cryonics. But you're right. I'm sure he doesn't have the mind. I think not. Yeah. Okay. I'm glad we could be of help. <laughs> <laughs> it's a real service we provide. <laughs> sure is. Chauvin's demeanor in the initial video made it easy for the jury to convict. This was a case of our feelings don't care about your facts. The hill the defense had to climb to overcome the court of public opinion was simply insurmountable. And then the next and the next one is on the same topic and similar. Can you read the judge's instructions to the jury? He covered many of the questions you are concerned about. Um, I have looked at them. I can't say I've I've read I every word, but uh, he, he did. But there's a question of what the jury sees and how they interpret the the judge's. Um, instructions in light of what the outer context is right? right so you know what do you do about a president who is pushing a jury towards a conviction especially i mean they weren't sequestered right right and they, they yeah. it was right you know yeah. in the jurisdiction i mean it's the whole thing is crazy yeah. um what are the evolutionary origins of hugs and kisses, whether romantically or platonically? Why would these particular gestures be tied to oxytocin production? I have my own hypothesis, but would love to hear your thoughts. Mm. Well. It's like, it's 18 questions. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so hugs and kisses are distinct in one way that I think is pretty important. I'm not just mm -hmm. talking about technique, frankly. Um <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> um, no, the here's the distinction. When you hug somebody, right? There is a point. You go through this. You pass through this uh, very close, intimate contact where you are looking at each other into a realm where you can't see each other at all. You specifically can't see each other, right? And so. I'm sorry, I just didn't expect us to go to YouTube instruction manual on hugs today. <laughs> <laughs> well, sure. Yeah. Um, but anyway, my point is, okay, so imagine that you are watching a false hug, a hug that somebody doesn't mean, mm -hmm. right, but that is necessary, is performative, is meant to... I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yes, everyone everyone knows this. Yes, everyone, okay. everyone has been brought into such a situation at some point. Right, but yes. imagine you're watching somebody who's being false and they're hugging and that mm -hmm. they uh, approach the hug looking like they are, you know, uh, on the same page. And then at the point that they are looking over the person's shoulder, they roll their eyes, mm -hmm. right? Okay. That's a pretty interesting phenomenon, right? The, the fact of this extremely close contact, but the opportunity for deception. Right. 
you're looking at me like I'm not even making sense. No, you are. I ju- it just occurred to me that uh, you're going right to the, the deceptive hugs when we were asked what the origins of hugs and kisses are. And you're like, let's talk about deception. <laughs> Which is like, it's true, like, it's part of it. That's why I said this is like 18 questions. This is one of the questions that this could be. Yeah. That we could Look, I mean, it, it's, it's, this needs, you know, maybe not a book, but a pamphlet at least, mm. right? Because okay. first of all, you've got a taxonomy of hugs and kisses, right? There's like romantic versions of these things. And as, got, as he writes, he, she, yep. Yeah. Um, and then you've got uh, platonic versions of these things um, and formalized versions and the what is conveyed is obviously a question of which realm you're in, right? Like how much is conveyed, mm-hmm. right? So if you if we take the European uh, kiss on the cheek thing, mm-hmm. right? Nothing can be conveyed, right? It can yeah. be so formalized that it is just the simple fact of it happened. Yes, you met this person on the street, and this is one of the things that happens when you do. Yeah. Um, but you know, like handshaking, where uh, the enthusiasm of handshake tells you something. There is something about the formalization. Well, handshakes like hugs reveal um, intent at some level, right? Like I'm, you know, I'm. Look, I'm not armed. Look, I'm not right. armed, right? Like you, you can just you can you can tell this is this is no threat. And obviously, usually if it's um, potentially romantic, that's not you know you're not concerned about that. Hopefully, um, but. Handshakes, not. I think kisses, not. But hugs have um, analogs in other primates, um, for sure. Mm-hmm. And indeed, it's not hugs exactly, but we even see among our, you know, our domestic animals. You know, we have we have cats. Cats are solitary as adults in the wild, except for you know one species, basically lions. And our domestic cats don't evolve from lions; they're from sand cats. Um, you know, we've got these two guys who were um, not litter mates, but they grew up, they were tiny in a feral cat colony together, and they sleep coiled tightly around one another. Yeah, which you often see with kittens. And, and there's we effectively a, permanently kittenize yeah, them. Yeah, we permanently, at least partially, kittenize the the domestic cats. Yeah. But that, I mean, that's, it's it's akin to a hug, you know, they, well, in some ways. Well, I wonder. So this, But certainly among the primates it is. Yes. Yeah. Um, the primate version is. The cat version, why do kittens pile themselves on top of each other? There are at least two reasons that have nothing to do with or don't inherently have anything to do with affection. One is heat and the other is schooling behavior, mm-hmm. right? So, um, if, I'll be half as likely to get eaten if I'm together with this other guy. Yeah, there's that. And then the fact is kittens like are you small. you with those carp circling you? Right. Mm-hmm. Yes. I Going back, I feel more threatened uh, retroactively than I actually felt in the moment. But mm-hmm. yeah. Um, but cats, uh, as they are smaller, have a larger surface to volume ratio, which means that they radiate heat at a high rate. And to the extent that heat is a super high cost, like 85% of take of calories that are taken in by a mammal uh, are used to maintain a body temperature. Well, that's even worse when you're tiny. Mm-hmm. Um, so piling on top of each other reduces the surface area and it means that everything around you is putting out heat too. So anyway, it's an energetically efficient thing to do. Now our cats who were effectively kittens together and still pile on top of each other, um, do seem to, there does seem to be an affection to it. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, for one thing, it often starts with like grooming and stuff. Yeah. Um, so, it, you know, it raises all kinds of questions about what they're doing. And obviously we have selected, not only have we kittenized our domestic cats. Not us in particular, but, but people humans. with cats, yeah. But we have also um, cultivated affection from them that might not be there in a wild adult version. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, yeah. So there's a question about what it means and whether, you know, they are effectively picking up on our physical affection um, rather than augmenting inherent cat physical affection. I must say I'm a little bit thrown because I sometimes hug our dog, which I know dogs don't especially like. <laughs> She's it, baffled. Yeah, it yeah. confuses her, um, which is part of why I think uh, it's kind It's of, amusing to you. It is amusing. Yeah, it's fun to baffle the dog in a good-hearted way. Yeah, she likes it. She just isn't so sure that that's the best approach to 
uh, yeah, she'd showing rather effect. Roll on the carpet with you with your legs in the air. Yeah, or something yeah. like that, or be pet or whatever. But yeah. um, so, what about um, any connection to oxytocin? Well, first of all, the thing to say about oxytocin is that uh, it has the order of discovery of its effects has um, resulted in us all having kind of a wrong basic idea about what it is. This um, is, I mean, that that is a general truth across, you know, like all domains, right? The the thing that it manifests in most obviously may well not be its most fundamental or important thing, but it shall forever after be associated with what, like breastfeeding, I guess? I don't even know what oxytocin is largely yeah. associated with. Cuddling, breastfeeding, yeah. um, basically, you know, the love hormone. But the point is yeah. it, love is one part of a puzzle. Um, it's yeah. the in-group, out-group hormone. And so love is the in-group version and hate is the out-group version and oxytocin is involved in both. Mm -hmm. um, so... And that, I mean, that's the case for so many of these things, right? Like, you know, serotonin prompts both the dominance and the submissive response in crayfish, right? Right. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so... Um, what to make of the release? I mean, really the thing to say about all of this hormonal stuff is that hormones are just a signal. They are an agreement between source and receptor that this object means this thing. And it's like you put a light on the wall and we say that that light means the building's on fire, right? We could decide that light means anything. Right. So there's nothing inherent about this molecule that means anything. It just happens that this molecule is one that has been used in the context of communicating certain things in group, out group. Mm -hmm. um, and so we shouldn't be surprised to see it used there um, and elaborated there. But it's really not about the molecule or the receptors. It's about the fact that something needs to be communicated because of the kind of creature you are and that this is the mechanism used to do it. Um, so I feel like we have not fully answered this question at all. But, no, really uh, hardly at all. Yeah. But there's a, thank you for the question. It was good. <laughs> Allowed us to think about a lot of things, some of which you had no interest in us thinking about, perhaps. Brett, your stories of feeling like a misfit hit a nerve. Did those feelings hinder or help in your personal evolution? Please tell us more. Love the show. Oh, yeah, they uh, <clears throat> absolutely helped. They're just so liberating. Um, and, you know, for those who maybe, maybe don't remember the conversation that this is alluding to, my feeling is misfit is a good term because it's non-judgmental if you think about it just literally, right? The fact that you are a misfit for some institution or organization doesn't say whether it's you who's off or it who's off. Mm -hmm. And it could be both. But, um, but when I was dealing with students and I, I took a special interest in students who uh, were misfits for uh, one reason or another – my point to them was you can embrace this category because it doesn't say anything about you, right? It says that in the context of this other thing that you maybe don't get along with, um, that there is a mismatch. But the I think the problem is if you're not a misfit, and I think, frankly, most interesting people are misfits at one level or another, right? They're just of an unusual type because in some sense, uh, if you find the world a very easy place, right, if it just all fits, then you tend to default into the modes that it has established and you become of a familiar type to the extent that you are a mismatch for something. You're forced to invent some mode that works for who and what you are. Um, and so I guess the point, I was enough of a misfit for the systems that I was forced to interact with that just doing what I was being asked wasn't going to work. And the discovery that it wasn't going to work didn't leave a lot of choice but to figure out something else to do. And so, uh, yeah, the, the net effect was liberating. And, uh, you know, I wish more people – the important part is the liberty. It's not the misfit part, right? So I wish more people had that license to figure out their own way. But you were unusual, at least by your own telling, and I didn't know you at this age, but um, in effectively from the moment that you were labeled by school as not worthy of it, um, of being certain that it was school who had gotten it wrong, as opposed to you who were fundamentally unfit for the world. And certainly most people don't don't start out there. Many people don't end up there. Many people conclude that they are actually a wrong person. 
yep. and and not okay. And that, you know they believe the um, the lies being told them about themselves. And you know that was also you know, many, many students whom we saw and, and many other people whom we meet are still wrestling with how to get through you know, a lifetime at that point up you know, up until whatever age they are of um, of believing. Um, bad authority authorities who told them things about themselves that made it very difficult to become their best selves. And somehow you, um, you seem to have been resistant to that from a very young age and, uh, you know, figuring out how to be resistant to that, I think would be extraordinarily useful for most people. Uh, and I don't, I don't have clarity on how that worked for you. And I feel, you know, that when we've talked about this before, not on camera, it sort of generally feels like well this like this is just like who you are but that's not useful advice yeah um so obviously i was very young at that point and so i only you know i have a kid's memories of of what that stage was about i do think some of it had to do you know at that age very young i had two living grandparents both of whom were very thoughtful um very smart and took a tremendous interest in in Eric and me. Um, and, you know, one of them, my grandfather, lived until he was 94. And so anyway, he was sort of a consistent force. And, you know, he had his own struggles. And so there was always a force basically leading towards suspecting authorities that wanted to give you a diagnosis that there was something wrong with you, that maybe it was the force that was wrong and not you. Mm. Um, but there was also, I think, something... So examples, more powerful if they're personal to you, but examples of here's when authorities are wrong when they try to... Here's examples of authorities being wrong when they've tried to diagnose other people. Right. Yep. And, you know, you remember Harry, uh, yeah. my grandfather, um, who was also a very fun... Um, engaging, disarming kind of a person. And so it wasn't just somebody there to say, actually, authority is a, a problem in and of itself, but it was, you know, a very appealing person who mm -hmm. showed how it was done, right? He used charm and humor and all of these things to get through a world that otherwise would have been quite hostile to him, and in some cases was quite hostile to him. But all of that existed in a context where I think also Jewishness has something to do with this. Because, you know, especially at the time when I was a kid, I didn't realize how recent World War II was. I mean, I obviously could do the calculation, but it seemed a very long time ago. It felt like it was so long ago. And by comparison to how long ago it is now, right. it was so recent. Right. It was so recent. And so anyway, the point was my elders were both responding to what they had seen that I hadn't. Um, no one in your immediate family had been in Europe during World War II. Uh, nobody in the in right. my immediate family right. had been there. Yep. Um, but there was a recognition of the fact that civilization could turn on you, right? And that was both about the Holocaust, but it was also about a much longer history of persecution. Sure. And so I think that there was something, there is something in Jewish culture, informal culture, that's about, yeah, you should learn to do the things that you're supposed to do, but you should also be aware that that thing can turn Always toxic keep on an you. Eye out. Yeah, keep an eye out because it can happen, right? And that was the mm -hmm. refrain from the generations that I knew ahead of me was, you know, be aware it can happen here. And you're going to want to be on the lookout for it. So mm -hmm. at the point you encounter some version of it that has nothing to do with ethnicity or anything. Right. But really is about some system that doesn't know what it's talking about, you know, trying to shift responsibility for its failures onto children. And right? it, and, and I imagine, maybe this is a caricature, but I, I sort of imagine this, these, some of your teachers early on, you show up every day still the same they're like didn't we stamp you yesterday where'd the stamp go i thought we i, I thought, thought we did this thing to you and you seem to have survived what is going on there and you know frankly it's there's an anti-fragility it's which is more than resilience and robustness it's an anti-fragility it's like oh you're gonna stamp me again okay let's see how this goes 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, and it really, I do recall, I'm sure it wasn't this clear, but I do recall a sort of choice between do I either accept its judgment and then everything downstream of that just looks really unpleasant or do I reject this? And then there are a bunch of unpleasant things that come with rejecting school's authority over you. But then there's also the possibility of making your own way. Mm -hmm. And it was just far and away the better deal. And so yeah. uh, I, you know, I would encourage you, if you know a kid who's faced with such a thing, to uh, get them to think in these terms. You know, school's judgment of you is far from everything. And in fact, it may, you know, especially as school gets stupider, yeah. it may be the worst thing for you. Um, so anyway, somewhere in there. Um, where were we? Okay. Uh, where, what are we at time wise, Zach? Okay. Oh, uh, we're going to miss a lot of good questions this time. So let's just do one more here and, um, and then we'll skip to this hour. Okay. If evolution is an underlying trait of the universe, can we assume that it also takes place for everything in the universe and not just living beings? Can the evolution concept be abstracted to explain why any given thing exists? Kinda. Um, so here's the, here's the thing. <clears throat> there is, um, there are a set of characteristics that account for how common any pattern is. And a pattern can be a species, a pattern can be a behavior, a pattern can be an organization of matter. Any pattern has a degree of commonality. Every element on the periodic table is a pattern, a recognizable pattern, right? How common each of the elements on the periodic table are the result of these parameters as are the construction of galaxies, everything else. And the parameters, if I can remember them off the top of my head, are um, the tendency to come into being, that's, a modifi that's my modification of a, a tendency to reproduce, mm -hmm. um, which is wrong. But the tendency to come into being, the um, durability once having been created, the likeness between instances, right? Are they similar enough to be recognized in the same category? And the tendency to accumulate stuff that is limiting, right? So those four characteristics, if you looked at all four of them together, dictate how often you should encounter any pattern, whether it's a type of creature or a shape of galaxy. Okay, so that is selection, right? That is selection deciding how common stuff is. Evolution. So hold on. So just to just to add there, selection therefore happens at the level of galaxies and at the level of worms and at the level of people. Yeah. Rocks on a beach. Rocks on rocks on a beach that are tight that are that have been shaped, arranged by the tide such that the larger rocks are in a different place from the smaller rocks. That's selection in action. Yeah. Without any organic evolution. So select. Yeah. Selection has nothing to do with biology. It doesn't require it. Um, it just is a fact it's of... It's independent of biology, it is, but it's absolutely inherent in biological it evolution. It's relevant, yes. yes. It is, uh, um, yeah, that what you said could be very misunderstood. Right. It could be misunderstood. It's, it yeah. continues on into biology, but it pre-existed biology. Okay. Mm -hmm. The thing that makes evolution, and when you say evolution, you almost certainly mean adaptation. Mm -hmm. The thing that makes adaptation different than the process of selection that we have just described, which is biologically independent, is the addition of one more factor. And that factor is heredity. Okay. So the fact of heredity causes a cumulative response to selection that is very biological. Right. So in the way in which you are right is that the process of selection, which is in some sense evolutionary, is ubiquitous and has nothing to do with biology. The addition of heredity, the invention of heredity by informational structures, then turbocharges that process and makes it into something that is so much more powerful that we recognize it as distinct, and that is biology. So um, anyway, you, you've, you're, you're onto a, an important truth, but there's another truth you need to tack onto it in order to see the whole picture. Yeah. Okay, uh, just two comments, two more comments from the last hour before we move into this hour. Uh, Asian carp are apparently invasive at Salvi's Island. Um, Salvi Island is not where you were, but it's a it's a large island just um, yep. west, northwest of Portland, I guess, uh, and in the Columbia. they are connected by, so the Columbia and the Willamette come together at Salvi Island approximately. 
Yep. Um, which means that if there are carp on South Island, and Oaks Island, Bottom is is in the is off an offshoot of the, of the Willamette, Willamette is mm-hmm. in fact connected. So it's by upstream water. by a fair bit of Salvi, but but if there are yeah. carp at Salvi Island, they're almost certainly at Oaks Bottom, which would make sense. And mm-hmm. I don't know what other creature that would be because those large scales, yeah, very, large very scales. big fish, very yeah. large scales. Um, so anyway, yes, I was imi- initially dismissive of the idea that it was carp, but I'm, I'm, if they're at Salvi Island, I'm utterly compelled. That's probably what it is. Yeah. So actually, I'm going to go completely out of order here because I just very quickly scrolled through. We got so many questions the next hour. Um, someone whom I know to be an ecologist says your bird from the first hour is actually a young bald eagle. Big Bill is a good clue for a photo like this with tough lighting obscuring the plumage. I, I think I think he knows what he's talking about. You know, it's funny. It was yeah. my first thought when yeah. I looked at it, and then because you've been, I mean, because we know that the bald eagle is nesting near there. There are bald eagles, yeah. but this animal. So I'm not saying this person is wrong. They're mm-hmm. probably right. This animal, and it's very hard to judge at a distance because there's nothing for scale. Mm-hmm. But this animal struck me as bigger. Mm-hmm. Right now, it could be the same. Bigger than a bald eagle, or just yeah. Oh. Bigger than a bald eagle. And I looked at it in comparison to the images of golden eagles in the uh, iBird Pro app. Mm -hmm. Um, And it looked like a close match. So anyway, I will go back and I will look at the... Well, if you've got any other photos, so I happen to have um, this guy's contact info. We might might get his uh, more detailed professional opinion as well. Okay. Um, And then the final question from last hour... I watch on a big screen 4K TV. My dog used to growl at your cats during the Q&A. He still does, but now he also growls at Brett's hey folks. Hashtag Skinner. (laughs) Well, all right. Making enemies in the dog world, Brett. Yes. Okay. Um, Let's see. This is another question, the likes of which we sort of responded to earlier, but so just starting from the top of questions from this hour, currently planning a baby and cannot decide on whether to get the COVID vaccine or not preconception with the increased risk of severe cases of COVID during pregnancy. Would love to hear your thoughts. Yeah. I I don't know. And in in this case, I actually really don't know what I would do, especially given that, um, um, it seems likely that all of the vaccines that we currently have available are going to um, require yearly um, yearly re-ups. Boosts, boosters, um, yeah. So, um, yeah, you really don't want COVID when you're pregnant. Yeah. And um, I don't know. So I would say I two know. things. One, yeah. uh, I'm just think about this from our perspective for a second, right? It might be that you're better off without the vaccine if you are in a position to protect yourself from COVID pretty well. But even if that were true, let's say that you were in the lucky position of being able to isolate yourself 95% uh, while, you know, in the run up to and during your pregnancy, you could still get COVID. Yeah. And then you could have serious even if it was ex ante the right thing to do ex post it could be harmful to you and your baby yeah. so the tempting thing and what the uh, authorities will do is they will advise you to take action and then they will downplay whatever harm might come to you and we're not going to do that but there's no good answer here yeah. right you're damned if you do and damned if you don't and the question is which way are you more damned and yeah um, and you know I, mean, I guess consider which which outcomes down each path, you will be better, best able to live with yourself should they should the worst thing happen. Yeah, there's that, although... And, and that, that answer will be different for different people. Yeah. I wish we knew what the worst thing was, and unfortunately, you know... This is there true. Are remote, yeah, there's, there's so much... Unknown. Remote chances of really bad yeah. downsides, uh, actually, to frankly, to both. Um, right. Uh, what I would say is that a lot depends on things we can't know, which are how exposed to COVID are you likely to be, right? Right. If you're, you know, there are circumstances in which somebody might have so little contact with the world mm-hmm. that the risks of the vaccine would be unconscionable. Right. Um, and then there are other But people. if you're going to be working, you know, if, if you work a job that is about to start to require you to be traveling a lot again um, and be in, you know, in meetings and close quarters and tight rooms with unopenable windows, it's a very different situation. Yeah. True. Sending extra love and healing your way, Heather. Thank you. 
I'm not saying they don't have mental, quote, <clears throat> quote from you. I'm not saying they don't have mental horsepower to think. I'm saying they say stupid shit all the time, and that's an indictment of whatever they're doing instead of thinking. <laughs> Next Dark Horse t-shirt, I'd wear it. <laughs> it's good. Yeah. All right. That's, that's a very quotable quote. Yeah. Um, thoughts on Caitlyn Jenner running for California governorship and Susan Wojcicki. Is that how you pronounce her last name? Wojcicki? I think you're missing a syllable. All right. Aren't you? Well, that's how it's spelled here. So I don't know. Um, Queen of the Karens is what this person says. Paying to give herself a free expression award post YouTube censorship. So I think this is two different things, right? I don't know about the uh, free expression award post YouTube censorship thing with Susan Wojcicki or whatever. Maybe there's a missing syllable in there. Um, I don't know anything about that. I don't either. Um, thoughts on Caitlyn Jenner running for California governor? Not yet. I, I barely know what happened. I don't, I don't. I don't. I have not had time to process it at all. I don't even know about this. Okay. Well, um, hey, but I, hey, guess what? Yeah. Caitlyn Jenner is running, so there's going to be a special election. I think there's a recall um, for Newsom, um, and there may be a special election, and Caitlyn Jenner is going to be running. Caitlyn Jenner. Mm-hmm. Um, that's all I. That's I probably got some of the details there wrong. That's all I know. Yeah, I would say um, I'm totally for the recall, and not sure why anybody would elect Caitlyn Jenner to the job. It seems to me like almost Both a points. month. I I get that. On the other hand, um, I don't know, but Republican apparently. So yeah, apparent. I guess I do know a little bit more. Confusing to everyone because no one knows what they should think. But I'm pro-trans, but Republican, but uh, she's a Republican, but I don't think she's a she. Like you know, people. No one who's just going by strict ideology and and battle lines that have already been drawn knows what to think. The thing is, but that doesn't make this person in any way fit for the job. <laughs> Right. right. And I mean, California isn't a big state, but s still it requires a certain amount of capacity to manage it. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, I can't imagine Caitlyn Jenner is competent for the job, but I don't know. Yes. Um, you know, the Jenner has uh, done remarkable transformations before. Maybe, maybe this is the one that we didn't see coming. Are we allowed <laughs> <laughs> to discuss? Her. Apparently some lefty show misgendered Jenner several times in discussing this because if you're going to come out as a Republican, we're allowed to misgender you or something. I don't even know. Okay. But here's the problem is that the rules about not misgendering her are not even tolerable. No, they're insane. Like did she, literal Olympia. Like, yes. <laughs> did she or did she not compete in the decathlon? She did not compete in the decathlon. Nope. Nor did she win the decat. Did she win? She won. No. She did he, he win? Won. Yes. Yes. So there's only one way to do this that makes any freaking sense, and that is to talk about the fact that Bruce Jenner was in the decast a lot and later became Caitlyn Jenner. Um in it later became a candidate for California cover. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh wait, wow. you missed the part about the reality TV um career. Reality mm -hmm. TV. Yeah. Uh in any case, yeah, I, this yeah. is a terrible idea. This is a terrible yeah. idea. Um, California is very important. It needs good governance. Frankly, I don't care what party the person comes from. Right. I care that they are highly competent and courageous and capable of standing up for good governance in California, period, the end. So... Um, I'm open to be convinced that Caitlyn Jenner is that person, but I've seen no indication of it so far. There's no reason she should have those characteristics. There's no reason to think that she does have those characteristics. Nope. Um, so let's find someone who does. Yeah. How, oh, so this this may actually even be from the same person um, as the question we asked. We answered earlier, how to screen out woke graduate schools? Uh, actually, no. I'm thinking of a biotechnology master's. I graduated almost 20 years ago with a BA in psych and anthro, biological focus. Is a science career feasible at this stage in my life? Um, graduated almost 20 years ago. You know, I, don't, I just don't know what is possible now, given what is happening in higher ed. Um, 10 years ago, uh, if you graduated almost 20 years ago, if you're 40-ish now, uh, and you were saying, I'm thinking of going back, um, yeah, and you know, a science career, 
you know, if you're thinking about an academic career, going back to grad school for an academic career to get a PhD, average time for, you know, field field biology, the likes of which we got is like seven and a half years, or at least it was. Um, it's, you know, it's a little bit late. You're going to have a hard time getting in. If you're looking for a job in STEM um, for which you want to, you know, you, you're looking for maybe a three-year, two-year um, degree, I don't see any reason that it's... Um, too late to switch, um, but I don't also don't know what goes on inside biotech MS programs. You know, that's that's not a liberal arts program, and I and I, I think that still the non liberal arts are um, more resistant to this crap. But I don't know. Yeah, it it's very hard to to say. <laughs> I mean, the joke about uh, cryogenic suspension was about something, which is that there's no, there yeah. has to be a university yeah. system in which you can go and get degrees and et cetera, but there doesn't appear to be one. So what do we advise people who should go? I, I don't know. Yeah. Where was I? Ah, is there a correlation between how important certainty of paternity is for a species and if it is visually detected and how much individuals look different? i.e. ants versus humans, or egg-laying species versus mammals? Love you, too. It's from Echo. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. Uh, of there's course. A lot, it's, you know, there's, a lot, there's a lot of questions in there. So there is a... I think. There is a famous back and forth between Dick Alexander and who would it be? Paul Sherman, maybe, on this I topic? I know. Um, basically... It's not going to be... Tinkle, it's not going to be Don Tinkle when, when they're sort of going at it. Okay. I don't think so. Okay. This is a little later than that. Um, let's put it this way. There's a question about is certainty of paternity important within a species, right? Which you might imagine would result in uh, phenotypic idiosyncrasies that would allow certainty of paternity to be established. On the other hand, to whom is certainty of paternity important? Right, so certainty of paternity is certainly important to fathers who are trying not to invest their parental effort in offspring that they think are theirs but aren't. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, that also puts a priority for mothers and offspring on not revealing that some offspring right. is not the uh, the product of, of the father who's doing the investing. So, so, so I mean, at least two things there, right? That um, there's going to be an arms race between. Um, a father who wants to detect paternity and a mother and offspring in all but a, you know, never, ever, ever cheats environment, um, restricting perfect access to that information from by the father. Yep. Um, so there's the norms race there. And the other issue, of course, is that um, the idea of visual detection is a bias um, that will be true for some organisms and not for others. For instance, um, I believe um, that it's fairly well known in some species of rodents, and you would expect this mammals wide, and in some other species, in some of their clades as well, the ability to smell MHC, mm -hmm. right? Smell yeah. major histocompatibility complex and therefore relatedness. Um, and um, you know, it's 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 valuable for kin recognition in terms of recognizing siblings and such. And I don't even know if the work has been done to see if, you know, if, if father, you know, I, th I think in the rodents where it's been done, there's no expectation of any paternal care. There's no pair bonding. There's like the dad doesn't even stick around. And so you just never even meet your dad. Um, but it is potentially used as a way to create, um, to prevent uh, inbreeding. Like yeah. if, you know, daughters later meet their fathers and he just smells too close, they're like, nope, not, right. not making babies with you. So there's that. There's the hypothesis that human babies don't look human for exactly this reason, to obscure <laughs> uh, paternity. You know, people don't say that out loud. No, they people don't, but <laughs> this people do. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. um, there's that. I would point out that in humans the avoidance of cuckoldry is largely not about uh, visual assessment of offspring. It is through an entirely other channel. It has to do with mate guarding mm -hmm. and what we call, marriage is an elaboration of what we would call mate guarding in some other creature, right? And so all of the behaviors involved in courting and sexual jealousy and all of those things are actually mechanisms to, uh, I don't want to say ensure because it doesn't ensure, but increases the likelihood or increases the certainty of paternity 
Um, so all of those things are part of that arms race. Mm -hmm. And I've always wondered whether or not actually you would expect on the part of cheating females a bias in favor of cheating with males that look like the investing partner. Mm, mm -hmm. Right? Sure. I mean, that's a rock solid prediction right oh, there, is yeah. it not? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So anyway, I, I've always wondered if, if uh, that would be borne out by by test. It certainly, I think, should be. But, um, but you know, it's possible that uh, our – it's possible that this the – This is consistent with the I have a type uh, oh, it is ain't meme ish. It? You're yeah. right. Mm -hmm. You're right. Um, all right. So anyway, like that. Cool. What's the deal with tickling? Are all vertebrates ticklish? Why can't I tickle myself? Yeah. Um, no, oh most God, vertebrates are not ticklish. ticklish. In fact, most mammals are not ticklish. There are a few examples. If I'm recalling correctly, they're I've irritable. Seen... You can irritate them. <laughs> <laughs> you can irritate any vertebrate. That's almost certain. <laughs> yes. um, but in terms of ticklishness, what is it? Is it? I'm tempted to say there's a prosimian that I've seen compelling. Uh, but, so that's not a that's not a clade anymore. Uh, no, it's not a clade because of tarsiers having been yeah tarsiers are off. somewhere weird. Um, and it's paraphyletic it anyway. Um, but anyway, non non monkey and ape primates. Right, like mm -hmm. uh, lemurs. It's not lemurs, but yes, lemurs is in Bush that babies, group. Bush babies, galugos. Yeah, I think it might be lorises. Yeah, galugos. No, no, you're thinking kaluga. You've got your galugos and your kalugos mixed up. I do, both yeah. of which are cute mammals. Yes. Um, yeah. But anyway, yes, there are a few examples of ticklish uh, mammals. Well, I think um, I think all the great apes are all the greatest apes. Well, are. I think I, I think. I think for sure we know chimps and bonobos. I think Coco, the basically domesticated gorilla, yep. was understood to be ticklish. I don't know about orangs. I don't know. You you wouldn't want to test it on an unsuspecting orang. No, but you could maybe you know convince a postdoc to <laughs> to test it. <laughs> um, all right, I had to. Um, okay, so let's get to the heart of the matter, though. Mm -hmm. So I do have a hypothesis. I don't know if I've deployed this hypothesis on either. Dark Horse or, or not. On you, didn't you do? Maybe you did a tickling you too. A little maybe I video. Did. I don't remember. Um, anyway, so here I'll give you the short version. Um, the thing about their conspicuous features of tickling: you can't tickle yourself. Um, nobody can walk up to you on a battlefield and tickle you and cause you to drop your weapon. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're hard to tickle in water. Uh, so anyway, my point is going to be tickling requires or ticklishness requires the prerequisite is a feeling of security. So the hypothesis is that tickling is a built-in trainer for effectively hand-to-hand -hand combat and that the idea is that there are places where you're very vulnerable and that this mechanism, oh, so there are lots of other features that belong on the list of, uh, first of all, where are you ticklish? That's an interesting list of places, right? You're ticklish on your neck, you're ticklish under your arm, you're your ticklish feet. on the bottom of your feet. Back of your knees. Back of your knees. And these are all places that if an enemy gets to, <clears throat> you screwed up, right? So the point, and, and then there's the reaction of children to being tickled, right? Mm -hmm. Children like being tickled. Stop, more, they stop. like the tickle game, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? They it's very easy to go too far if you are, you know, tickling a child who is playing the tickle game with you and you keep tickling them in the same place over and over again, they can get very upset, right? So, anyway, my point is this is a built-in training program for learning to protect vulnerable places, right? And so the idea of, hey, I want to play the tickle game is like, yeah, I want to practice uh, that thing so I can protect myself later, right? So you learn to protect yourself. Being tickled in one spot ex if for an extended period of time isn't productive because you're not learning anything new about how to protect that spot. You've already yeah. lost control of it. The positive feedback of, um, well, if you get somebody, you know, if you manage to get your finger under their armpit, they become spastic and they have a hard time <laughs> protecting themselves. That's useful too, because the point is it ups the ante for preventing somebody from accessing you in the first place rather than just fending them off once they've gotten to you. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, the long and short of it is 
It's a built-in program for trusted individuals to train each other into protecting uh, against uh, hostile enemies later. And that, that explains all of these odd symptoms of ticklishness, that it requires trust, that you both do and don't want to be tickled, that you, you know, all of, all of the features we just discussed. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, oh, so, and the prediction, got to have a prediction. Sure. Right. The prediction would be that um, those who have engaged in uh, being tickled and learning to prevent it uh, as youth would be better in a better position to protect themselves. They would be more effective right. at fending off uh, hostile hand-to-hand -hand combat. Mm -hmm. That's one prediction. Any advice for a salamander who's met a girl more interested in his gametes than his genome? He sure seems interested regardless. By the way, thanks for the ID. So this is just a follow-up to mm. the person who wrote in thinking they found a lizard yeah. uh, in their garden outside of Seattle, uh, but it was in fact an uh, was it an Ambystoma macrodactylum, a well, long-term salamander. Of course, it was an Ambystoma macrodactylum. Oh. Macrodactylum. Dactylum. Yep. Sorry for your loss. My mother took her own life at seventy-nine two years ago. As a Christian, she searched night before if she could still go to heaven. My mo my wife's mother died the very same day, South Korea, of cancer. Oh, man. Wow. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's terrible. Um, I am sick with COVID for the second time in Ohio. I gave it to my coworkers. One of them had COVID before. We were both sick seven months ago. Millions who have already been sick think they are safe, but it's not true. Could this be mutation or only antibody immunity? Uh, could be either. Yeah. I would say the yeah, danger. Yeah, it totally could be either. Yeah, the danger of mutants that, you know, this is exactly the topic of the podcast with uh, Garrett Vandenbush, um, is escape mutants. And escape mutants can be escaped from vaccine-induced immunity. They can be escaped from uh, COVID-induced immunity. But this is the danger, is that we are going to start um, deploying technologies without reference to the evolutionary consequence of those technologies. And we have experienced this before in other contexts. We've experienced this with respect to um, antibiotics and resistance, yep. and we have experienced it with respect to pesticides and resistance. You know, places where you think, oh, pest bad, chemical kills pest good. Uh, you deploy it, and then it's like, oh, pest evolves, right? Um, oops. Yeah, oops. Oh, right, evolution. Damn. Right. And so the question at the heart of the podcast is, does the vaccine regime make the process worse than it would otherwise be? Does it drive mutations you would, would not otherwise see? And are those mutations more successful at doing things like, in the worst case, mm -hmm. making people who were immune, like young people, sick, right, by changing uh, the, the nature of the virus's interaction with the immune system? Um, and so, again, don't know the answer, but it is a very interesting and reasonable line of inquiry. Next question is from um, Mary, who asked a question a week or two ago, and I said, geez, I recognize that name. I'm wondering if this is the same Mary I had as a student. She writes in, yes, previous student, sending love um, to me. Um, lizards falling out of tree, and then asks another question. Lizards falling out of trees due to cold weather in Florida. I'm wondering what are the other, what any other incredible adaptations we might see due to uh, climate change. Yeah, and I'm thinking. I mean, I'm thinking about uh, the polar bears that we talked about with regard to um, going after the the duck eggs um, <clears throat> for more of their for more of their summers. Yep. Um, than they normally would have. So we talked about that. We so talked about the possibility. So this is going to be like range expansion and contraction. Range expansion and contraction. Um, there was a bunch of interest some years ago in these mega. Hymenopteran hives. I think they were beehives, actually. So not giant-sized individuals, but giant-sized hives. Giant-sized hives. And Hymenopterans being ants, bees, and wasps. Right. And there was a question as to whether or not this was a result or was it was a response to uh, climate change. Um, so I would say the thing to remember is that the critters out there have some history with a world that changes. 
and they may have contingency plans that will emerge um, as the conditions they face change. Some of these things will be familiar to us because the creatures exist across a range, and so at the edges of their ranges, they're already effectively in a changed circumstance, and some of them will not be. Yeah. Um, but anyway, there's a lot of a lot of potentially interesting patterns that we could see. Yeah, I'm not coming up with any else right now. It, it's easier to think about, you know, obviously range expansions, contractions, um, moving into into kinds of habitats that they haven't been in before and running into new kinds of competitors, predators, parasites, et cetera. Well, you might imagine a an extinction crisis and a shift in the direction of generalists, both within and between species. Mm -hmm. That's one thing uh, yeah. that would be likely. Um, now, we're already creating an extinction crisis through all sorts of other mechanisms. Um, yeah, so habitat so loss and... And, and, and pollution and, and fragmentation and, yeah. and roads and yeah. Yep. <clears throat> okay, we're gonna do a couple more. We had a relatively short first one. I know you got places to go, Mr. Producer, but um we got a ton of questions here, so we're gonna do thank you. <clears throat> do you like it when I call you Mr. Producer? I don't mind. Okay. Uh is your deputy producer sitting with you? Yeah, professor. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. deputy producers sleep on the, sleep job. On the job. Yeah, and that's cats for kind of what they do. Yeah. Um, I never remember what this um, acronym means. IIRC. Zach, what does IIRC mean? Oh, um, I, I, it's an obvious one, and I just never I forget it. Um, okay. So we'll come back to that one. Um, regarding the chat with Doctor uh, Bush. There's a, there's a lot of, just hold, hold on. Can you save it until I'm on with the next? Actually, no, we'll, we'll go there first. Yes. What does it mean? Uh, currently it's the most awesome news, but isn't that really cool? Okay. But it can mean a bunch of other technical things. Well, let's see if that makes sense. Isn't it really cool that the president made comments after sequestration? Also, the judge mentioned Waters' comments provided basis for appeal. If retried, um, will there be worse riots? So I think the first comment is just sort of, uh, you know, mildly snarky, if if it means isn't it really cool? Um, but the question here is, um, if he's reached, I mean, he there is going to be an appeal. Well, right? of course, um, so be an there, appeal. He, he will be retried, but the, I think what the question means here is right. If 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 the appeal comes back with a different um, different Verdict. outcome, yeah. um, or will there be worse? Uh, apparently the chat says if I remember correctly. If I remember correctly, that makes more sense. Uh, if I remember correctly, the president made comments after sequestration. Um, oh, so the implication is that the jurors wouldn't have heard them. But, but I thought they weren't sequestered. In any case, um, yeah. the uh, if a a friend asked whether or not there was something odd about the number of appealable errors that the mm -hmm. uh, trial judge seems to have made. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering in response if actually this didn't make a degree of sense too, because if you were in the unfortunate position of... Um, if you were the judge? If you were the judge in mm -hmm. this case, um, you wouldn't want to be responsible for an outcome that did result in rioting, but... Uh, that might be the natural result of the court functioning in the way it's supposed to function. Mm -hmm. And so the um, <laughs> conducting the trial in such a way that it would be overturned on appeal would solve this problem from the judge's perspective. I mean, and it's obviously, a, a permanent mark on your record as a judge. But well, I don't know how much I don't know how much it matters. I mean, courts yeah. overturn each other all the time. It's obviously the questioner is correct that it might be that you would see even worse riots as a result of a different outcome in a second trial, and therefore there might be some cost I, I, to it. I guess it. I don't know. Like you know, we we can never know worse because the one didn't happen, regardless of you know, did it happen now? Did it happen then? Did they never happen? There's no comparison at all. But if if it does, if we do get a different result next time, there will be riots. Will they be worse? You can't know because you don't know what the riots would have been this time. I, I think um, there will be um, deep, actual, heartfelt um, grief and anger 
And there will be a whole lot of piggybacking on that deep, actual, heartfelt grief and anger at the sense that there was a, an injustice if the verdicts were overturned, um, piggybacking by the same kinds of people who are making a mess of Portland, right? Oh, and yeah. th those are the people who do the most damage, um, at least now. Uh, well, and so, you know, worse, uh, you know, impossible to say. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we can't say anything for sure. Um, we can say likely, I think. But yeah. there's also um, several instances in which, uh, you know, obviously nobody speaks for um, for a leaderless movement. But uh, there were several claims that the verdict were the result of uh, protests and uh, rioting which I think are frankly credible. Mm -hmm. And so then there's the question of what game are we in and to the extent right. that uh, verdicts might be overturned on appeal, yeah. um, we are uh, to the extent that the mob has any influence whatsoever on these outcomes, we are increasing the incentive yeah. um, for them to engage in this behavior. Yeah. Um, regarding the chat with Dr. Bush, Bush, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, Vaccine accelerating the virus adaptation assumes that vaccine produces identical antibodies in everyone, but everyone will develop different antibodies even in response to the same vaccine. No, I don't um, think th I, I. You should answer this, but my my immediate response to this is that I don't think that his hypothesis assumes that the vaccine produces identical antibodies in everyone. Yeah, it certainly doesn't assume yeah. that the antibodies are actually identical. Yeah. It does. In, I mean, the vaccine technology itself will produce antibodies to the same antigens, which the, will therefore the, be very antigen similar. The antigen is identical. Well, right. the vaccine produces the antigen. The only way that it can work is to trigger the immune system to create antibodies and T cell responses that respond to those antigens. Yeah. And the vaccines are narrowly focused on the spike protein. Right. So... Uh, I'm not sure what it would mean even for them for the antibodies to be identical. Uh, they don't have to be. You can have multiple different formulas that result in the same affinity. And it's really the affinity of the antibodies for the antigens uh, that uh, that drives the the scenario that that uh, that Dr. Vandenbush is pointing to. Yeah. Um, I'd have that. So I, I'm not, I have I'm, to listen to your whole conversation before I can add more. I think. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure there's anything to say other than it doesn't require that they be identical. Uh, nor I don't think any does anybody expect them to be identical, but they yeah. should be quite similar in terms sure. of their affinities. Yeah. Um, I am part of an innovative project which started just as the world shut down. So cool. Organic flavored water for children with zero sugar and paper straws. Advice for entrepreneurs who want to do good? Advice for entrepreneurs who want to do good. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure what to say. COVID yeah. uh, was an arbitrary force economically that created um, opportunity in some sectors and killed it in other sectors and... You know, maybe some folks predicted this, but yeah. by and large, uh, it intervened in an arbitrary way. And, you know, it's hard to advise people on arbitrary forces like that. Yeah. My 13-year-old and 16-year-old were admitted to Ballet Austin's three-week summer intensive. Now they're asking for the COVID-19 vaccine. They presumably being Ballet Austin, not the children. The children have perfect health. Last flu was in 2016, but I found Bush's argument sound. I don't want to mess with their immune system. Now what? I didn't even know that 13-year-olds, I didn't think that any of the vaccines were allowed were in, yeah. less, in lower than 16 yet. Um, um, I, I would approach the program and yeah. I would say there is no reason to vaccinate people this young because so far they are immune and there are hazards that are not being discussed. And no matter what else this program can say, they can't tell us what the danger of these vaccines is long term. And people this young have a much longer road ahead of them than anybody else. So yeah. um, I would appeal to somebody in that program with discretion and say there's no medical yeah. reason 
to vaccinate people this young. They appear to have innate immunity that functions very effectively. Um, and there are reasons not to do it, which have to do with hazards that nobody on earth can tell you don't exist. So, um, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't vaccinate kids that young. Yeah. This is older people, but not by a whole lot. I heard, I haven't fact checked it, um, but that Lewis and Clark college just here in Portland, um, has said that students returning to campus in the fall will have to be vaccinated. Well, I'm. I have the sense that we will all ultimately be forced to be vaccinated. And I think it's, you know, it's not that I am against the idea of requiring vaccination in a system where the vaccines um, have really been made as safe as possible and where it is clear um, that the benefits outweigh the costs. But um, not this disease, not these authorities, yeah, um, and not these vaccines. It just... It's, it's too dangerous. Yeah. Um, I tend to agree, agree with Heather's position, but here's this. And there's a link to Wolfram, um, Wolfram Math World is what it's called on palindromic numbers. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm going to persist in my niche wrong position. Uh, this is our seventh palindromic uh, episode, but apparently it's actually our 16th. Well, someone mentioned that if you count binary, it's 16 anyway. Mm. Cool. Oh, and and there hasn't been another one since then, so we're still at like sixteen. Okay, that would have been really cool if this was our actually. I can't, I can't, I can no, I could at one point, but I can no longer do binary quickly enough in my head to get to what it is. But uh, um, well, that's that's coolish then. Yeah, yeah. Um, are there any methods for genetically engineering a pathogen without leaving a trace, other than serial passaging? Yeah. There are molecular techniques, um, you know, and it depends what you mean by engineering. From the ground up, no. Mm -hmm. Can you modify a pathogen so that it is more effective and do so in a way that um, does not leave a trace? Yeah, and in fact, uh, the Barrick Lab uh, pioneered some of this stuff. I think, what did they call them? They had a special term, like no -seum splices or something that's right yeah um, <clears throat> i don't remember yeah but anyway the answer to your question is yes it can be done um mm -hmm. it's a shame that it can be done in general uh lab work that allows you to detect you know where your edits have ended up uh is useful and the ability to obscure these things is obviously prone to abuse but um yeah it, it's it's possible yeah Okay, let's do one more. Um, it's it's getting late. Mm -hmm. um, actually, two more. We got one from Donald J. Trump himself. Wow. Who says, I tried tickling Hillary, but it didn't work. <laughs> she didn't feel safe with you, man. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's yeah. the thing. Yeah, she shouldn't have. Um, and you shouldn't have felt safe with her either, right? Um, different kind of lack of safety. Yeah. But, uh, uh, Stanford study, last question. Facial recognition algorithm correctly noted gay men at 81% and lesbians at 74%. If these findings hold, do hormonal differences in sex, sexual orientation point toward a genetic cause despite no gene being having been found? Um, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Let me just say before you before you riff that um, you know the 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 search in all of these sorts of things for like the gene is always misguided. There's not there's for any complex trait um in especially in humans there's if if there is a genetically heritable component it is going to be polygenic um not um not a single gene so um no gene has been found is no surprise to anyone actually if you're actually thinking it through um go for it all right so here's my maybe <laughs> um maybe you have let's say it's polygenic uh some tendency towards let's say becoming a lesbian uh, Note that I did not say that it was going to have a genetically heritable component. Right. Just, just, that just if it that. were, let's it's say, not going to be a single gene. Yes. Right. So then that thing could adjust uh, hormone levels that would adjust development such that phenotypic facial characteristics that would then be recognized by an algorithm uh, would show up. And that would explain this finding. On the mm -hmm. other hand, there are lots of other things that can do it too. So don't forget, these are hormones. Their levels may be sensitive to things 
uh, in the environment, like let's say lesbian environments uh, trigger the production of testosterone in women who tend towards, uh, I don't know, it could be in all lesbians or it could be in butch lesbians. Um, but in any case, so it could be that this inverts cause and effect and that it isn't a genetic cause, but it is a response to something in the environment that reinforces the production of those hormones. That's one possibility. Mm -hmm. It is also possible that there, and actually this is consistent with that, it is also possible that there is something in the feedback between individuals. So people try to look attractive to those they want to be attracted to them. And it may be that this is causing the um, something about the way they carry themselves or augment their features or something like that to show up that these algorithms would detect. And so basically, mm -hmm. if these are learning algorithms, which presumably uh, they are at one level or another, they could be picking up on things that are downstream of genes or they could be picking up on things that are not. And it's hard to tell which of those things is taking place. So I would not say this indicates anything other than possibilities. I agree. I think that brings us to the end. The end. The the end. The end. The end. Um, so once again, um, consider joining us at my Patreon for tomorrow's private Q&A. The questions have already been asked. Um, after we're done here, Zach is going to collate them, and then I will choose them tonight and tomorrow. But we will be looking at the chat in real time between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. as we do our live Q&A tomorrow. And if you're interested in that, join me at my Patreon. Join Brett at his uh, for conversations with a smaller number of people yet. Including next week, the Coalition of the Reasonable. Yep. Yep. Um, Send any questions you have to darkhorse.moderator at gmail.com. Uh, consider subscribing to this channel, to the Clips channel, uh, to um, join us at our Patreon, join us on social media, on, on Twitter. Like, subscribe, comment, circulate material, shake your fist at Facebook in their authoritarian nonsense. And shake your tail feathers at anyone who, fan who you fancy. That's that's not a bad idea. That often yeah. works. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, there was something else. Oh, yes. Check out the Geert Vandenbush podcast. And uh, the link in the description will take you there. Another link will take you to my unheard piece from last week on Portland. Um, maybe that's it. Be good to one another. And eat good food. And get outside. And get outside.